This episode is brought to you by Microsoft 365. Your life doesn't have to be filled with missed appointments and forgotten emails. With Outlook in Microsoft 365, you can have everything all in one place. Read your emails, calendars, and mix personal with business for optimum organization. You'll also get access to Office apps like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, plus one terabyte of cloud storage. To learn more, go to amazon.com slash Microsoft 365. Welcome to the New Books Network. In a global context of widespread fears over Islamic radicalization and militancy, poor Muslim youth, especially those socialized in religious seminaries, have attracted overwhelmingly negative attention. In northern Nigeria, male Quranic students have garnered reputation of resorting to violence in order to claim their share of highly unequally distributed resources. Drawing on material from long-term ethnographic and participatory fieldwork among Quranic students and their communities, Quranic schools in northern Nigeria, Everyday Experiences of Youth, Faith, and Poverty, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, offers an alternative perspective on youth, faith, and poverty. Mobilizing insights from scholarship on education, poverty research, and childhood and youth studies, Hannah Hochner describes how religious discourses can moderate feelings of inadequacy triggered by experiences of exclusion, and how Quranic school en- enrollment offers a way forward in constrained circumstances, even though it likely reproduces poverty in the long run. In our conversation, we discuss the rural economy of northern Nigeria, educational options for young boys, the activities of the Quranic school, how boys support themselves through domestic service, youth masculinity, poverty and economic instability, the politics of respectability, the prayer economy and spiritual services, and participatory research and video production. I'm one of your co-hosts, Christian Peterson, and thanks again for listening to New Books in Islamic Studies, a channel on the New Book Network. Without any further delay, here's my conversation with Hannah Hochnar about Quranic schools in northern Nigeria everyday experiences of youth, faith, and poverty. Welcome, Hannah, to New Books in Islamic Studies. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about your book, Chronic Schools in Northern Nigeria. Um, we always start a little bit about the author, though. So can you, you tell us a little bit about your background or training, uh, perhaps uh, moments or influences that shaped kind of the questions you are interested in answering or the, the types of places you're interested in studying, what, what brought you to uh, your research? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I have quite an interdisciplinary background, which is also reflected in the book. So my undergraduate was actually in international relations. And then I did a master's in um, development studies at, at the Uni- University of Oxford. And there I had um, courses in the anthropology and sociology of childhood and anthropology more widely, widely. And I think these were quite important influences for me, um, finding the topic of, of this of this book. Um, and then also the topic of my PhD. So already for my master's, I um, started working on Quranic education in northern Nigeria. And then I um, dug deeper for my PhD. Also on Quranic yeah. education in northern Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so how how did this this kind of um, start for you? Where where did this kind of come onto your radar, and and then how did this start to develop as a, a project for you? Yeah. So a little bit by accident, <laughs> um, I did an an internship in microfinance during my undergraduate um, in Senegal, and I didn't particularly enjoy the <laughs> internship, unfortunately. But that was the first context where I. Um, was exposed to um, the Quranic education system in West Africa. And there are lot of, lots of similarities across um, all of West Africa or Muslim West Africa um, with the very similar um, Quranic education systems. Um, and so I should maybe say about this system that it is um, schools where boys and young men come to live with a teacher away from home. So it's sort of a boarding school, but often with very limited resources on so no elaborate structure. Um, and many of the younger students are out on the street um, and often beg for their sustenance. So they beg for food. They also beg for for money. And so they're very visible, and they're very visible in Dakar, where where I did this internship. 
And everybody talks about them. Everybody complains about them. Everybody has a very strong opinion about them. And I found that quite intriguing. And I felt what is actually missing from that conversation is is the point of view of these young people in these schools. Um, what, 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 how do they see their own education and what are their opinions? And so I think I, I got interested in, in studying their opinions with this background of um, the anthropology and sociology of childhood that puts a lot of emphasis on, um, on speaking with young people themselves and, and giving them the right to also voice their opinions and to also be heard in research. So that's where my interest came from, that I felt their perspectives are actually missing, um, but everybody talks about them with, with, um, you know, with a lot of passion and emotion. And then um, I ended up um, going to Nigeria because my supervisor at the time, um, Professor Masuda Bano, she was involved in, an, in a DFID-funded um, education project in northern Nigeria, in Kano, and felt that that linked up nicely with my research interests. And then I continued on to the PhD because I felt I hadn't answered all the questions I wanted to ask to answer within the space of my master's dissertation and was then supervised by um, um, Professor Abdurov Mustafa, who is Nigerian himself and um, was very happy for me to keep, continue my work in, in Nigeria. Mm. And he's sad, very sadly passed away in 2017, so before the book came out. That's, that's too bad. Um, so much of the project is... Uh, coming out of the, the field work uh, that you did. Um, so can you give us a, a snapshot of, of this uh, time in Nigeria? H- how did you approach your field experience? Uh, what were like the primary sites you were at? What challenges did you, did you face in that context? Yeah, so my approach was very ethnographic. So I spent three months for my for my uh, master's research in Kano, and then um, eleven months for my PhD research. And I've been back in two thousand eighteen um, for um, six weeks. And so, yes, my my aim was to spend as much time as possible in or near Quranic schools and with Quranic students to understand their lived experience um, from their point of view. Now, I'm white. I'm a woman. I'm not a Muslim. I'm an adult. And so all of that set me apart from um, from the Quranic students whose experiences I was interested in. I also, um, you know, have, a, have quite a different socioeconomic status to to these boys and young men who are mostly from poor rural families. And so um, getting access was quite a challenge and um, pushed me to be quite creative with my methods. So I lived in a neighborhood right next door to a Quranic school that um, allowed me to befriend the students of that school eventually. So often they came um, to visit um, our compound where Europeans had been living for several years. Um, and so that household had a reputation for having unconventional adults, if you want, that um, um, that play with children or that um, need to learn Hausa, um, so the, the lingua franca in, in northern Nigeria. So I interacted with Quranic students by virtue of living in that neighborhood where there was a Quranic school just next door um, in, in urban Kano. Um, I also lived in a rural part of Kano State for four months in the household of the traditional ruler there. Um, and in that household, there were also Quranic students who were working there. Um, and I, I interacted with them in that household. But then I also... Um, ended up teaching English to Quranic students in different schools, both in urban Kano and then in al Basu, the, the, the rural area, um, often on, on um, Thursdays and Fridays, which are the weekend days of the Quranic school, so the students have a bit more time um, for other things. And that was one, uh, one way of getting to know them and, and um, interacting with them regularly. Now, being a teacher comes with a, all a set of assumptions that you have authority, that you're somehow... Um, um, a bit apart from your students. Um, and so that wasn't ideal necessarily for building up an, an, an equal relationship. Um, and so I also experimented with other other techniques. In my master's, I used um, participatory photography. So Quranic students took pictures of things that were important to them and we discussed the photos. Um, and that was a great tool to get access to aspects of the Quranic students' lives that I didn't necessarily have access to otherwise. So I wasn't allowed into the mosque, for example, um, where the where, where lessons were taking place. I um, 
couldn't follow the Quranic students when they went begging, for example, um, probably that wouldn't have helped them <laughs> earn anything if a white, white person stands right next to them. Um, so, yes, um, these photos were, were a great source of insight. Um, then the Quranic students also conducted what, what I've called radio interviews with each other. So I used to tape record some of our conversations um, the, and showed, showed the young people how the tape recorder worked and they found it quite um, entertaining to hear their own voices played back. And so um, I, I encouraged them to, to play journalists and to interview each other um, as part of the, of the research. And that, that worked really well. And the, yeah, it was quite enjoyable to the Quranic students to have this more playful form of expressing their views and, and concerns. Um, but a very big part of my master's project was the production of a participatory docudrama. So that idea for, for um, producing a film together with Quranic school, school students emerged as I found the other, other ways of interacting that I had to some extent limiting. Um, and so I was always on the lookout for new, new reasons for spending time with them, new reasons for learning about their, their opinions. Um, and also, I should say, I've just kept encountering these very stereotyped, very negative ideas about Quranic education. And I felt a film would be a great way of giving Quranic students a space to portray the education system from their point of view and to counter these very stereotyped um, um, depictions. And yes, so that's how the, the idea for the film came about. I managed to secure a bit of funding from the Goethe Institute, which is a German cultural um, foundation that supports cultural projects. Um, they've left Kano now, but um, they were still operating there um, by, in 2011 when I, when I did this project. So I had a bit of funding from them. Um, then I recruited nine Quranic students from different schools that I had been interacting with before um, as I was teaching English. Um, and then the school that I was living next to in, in Kano. So nine students then received training in filmmaking skills from um, professionals from the Kennywood film industry. So that's, I don't know if, if listeners are familiar with um, Nollywood, the Nollywood film industry, the Nigerian film industry. There's also a Kano-based film industry, Kennywood. And so we had two professional filmmakers from that industry and that provided training to the Quranic students in filmmaking. Um, now, I should say that many of these Quranic students haven't been to formal education. They didn't know anything about filmmaking. I didn't either. Um, but it, it um, was a really challenging and interesting project to um, to get everybody to the point where we were able to, to produce this docudrama together, um, which has been very well received and um, has won an, a prize in Nigeria and has been screened at um, a couple of international film festivals as well. And so this film portrays the trajectory of a Quranic students or al-Majiri, um, as, as they are called in Hausa, from the rural village um, where he comes from um, to, to the city where he's involved in the Quranic school. And then it describes all the, all the challenges and difficulties that he encounters, abuse from the rich in society that um, exploit his labor as, as a household help um, and don't really care well enough for, for him. Um, then also difficulties finding food, finding soap to wash his clothes, all these yeah, challenges that Quranic students encounter in their daily lives. And then eventually he graduates happily and, <laughs> and teaches younger students. So it's, it's a happy ending. Um, but yes, so this, this, producing this film was a real goldmine in terms of data because I spent plenty of time with the nine Quranic students that were part of the production process and um, learned through spending their time about about their experiences. And then obviously the film also um, gave rise to conversations about what they wanted to present on screen, what, what were the key messages they wanted to get, to get across to wider society. And that was very much about countering stigma, about um, emphasizing their morality, um, emphasizing, emphasizing or challenging negative conceptions that associate Quranic education with negative outcomes, um, Hood, be becoming hoodlums, becoming terrorists in the context of Boko Haram, etc. So um, I learned about all of these concerns throughout the film production process. And these are also key themes in the book. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> no, that was great. And the, uh, the docudrama is really uh, 
great. I think it could, could actually be uh, used in our classrooms as well as a way to kind of introduce um, a lot of the work you do in the in the book uh, much more uh, developed, of course. But um, you know, if you only have a week to to focus on something, it's a it's a really good way to kind of get at a lot of these questions and and tensions that are happening um, in this uh, religious education in Nigeria. I think it, it could be really useful. Um, I've used it in some of my teaching, yeah. And it's it's available on YouTube, um, so anybody who would like to watch it um, can find it. It has English subtitles. It makes it. There's also a French a, a version that's subtitled in French, if that's of any interest to anybody. Mm. Um, so um, before we get into um, more of the kind of the, the nitty gritty, um, can you can you give us kind of a, a, a snapshot or a, a bigger portrait? of the El Najri system, um, what, what should we kind of know in general about it? Um, where does it fit into kind of the social and economic context of the region? Um, and, and how do you kind of hinted this already, but how, how does kind of the, the, the broader, uh, society view, uh, students in this schooling system? Yeah. So first of all, it's not only a an education system that exists in northern Nigeria. There's similar education systems all across Muslim West Africa or the West African Sahel. So um, I think sometimes in Nigeria I encountered opinions on the system that said it's a Hausa um, problem, um, but actually, no, it's a much wider phenomenon in, in, um, that exists in other societies as well. And I think it is closely related to... Um, the agricultural economy and the kind of the climatic conditions um, in that in that particular region. So um, these are schools. Often they are mobile. They move um, with seasonal follow seasonal agricultural rhythms. Um, so often students move to urban areas during the dry season when there isn't um, much agricultural work to be done, and then return home um, to help um, farm during the rainy season. Or sometimes entire schools move. Um, between rural and urban area according to the ag- agricultural season. So it, it fits in very well with this um, larger climate and um, agricultural system that is very, where, where, where demand for labor is very seasonal. Now, it is one form of education, um, of, of Islamic education in a context where there are also other forms of education. Um, so we have the kind of government secular education system um, that has been introduced by the British um, under colonial rule and that has since then gained prominence and produced kind of the political elite. Um, there are lots of issues with this education system and, and inequalities where often um, poor rural communities have access only to um, very poor quality education and without necessarily opportunities to find employment with that education later on. So that's that's the modern education system. Then there's also a modern Islamic education system um, which is more a kind of a day school based um, system that resembles the um, secular modern education system that we probably all are familiar with um, quite closely. Um, so students would um, in these schools um, would sit in a classroom with desks, have a blackboard, notebooks, etc., and learn um, Islamic subjects, but also sometimes secular subjects. Now that's th- um, these are the kind of the more formal education systems, if you if you want, and then the Quranic education system is quite different, and um, is uh, many people label it informal. Now, I I'm not sure if these distinctions, formal and informal, are very helpful, but um, these Quranic schools are very different in that they um, don't have all this formal infrastructure, and um, often a school is based around a teacher, a teacher's personality, and students come to live with a teacher. Um, so girls might attend Quranic schools um, as day students um, and then return home to their parents. But boys and young men often come to live and with the teacher, often for a long, you know, several years even. <clears throat> now, teachers might have um, space to shelter students, but sometimes they don't. So um, students are sheltered in the neighborhood. Neighbors might um, accommodate them in their entrance rooms to their houses. Sometimes they sleep in the open. Um, so that raises... Um, a series of issues around um, these young people's well-being um, as they might not have access to um, sanitary facilities or proper shelter where they can sleep um, sheltered from the seasons. Um, also, as 
as the teachers often don't have means to um, for the upkeep of their students, they are very much responsible for feeding themselves. So younger students um, would beg often for food, sometimes also for money to buy things like soap or new, new shoes, new clothes, um, these kind of things. And many of the younger students work as domestic helpers. So they would work um, in houses in the neighborhood. It's a context where uh, many women are quite strictly secluded. So um, they wouldn't go out um, during the day or without their husband and then rely on children as go-betweens to run errands for them, um, to fetch water, um, take out the dustbin, buy food, etc. And so often Quranic students do these kind of jobs um, while they are younger. Older Quranic students often um, work in the petty economy, all kinds of petty trading. Um, some are motorbike um, taxi drivers. So they have all kinds of professions in, in the petty economy to sustain themselves. And all of that is because the school doesn't receive any, any money from the government. It's completely community-based. Um, and so the young, young people in these schools um, need to um, organize their own upkeep. Now, these Quranic schools focus... Um, very much on, on memorization of the Quran. So um, especially beginners start very much with only the Quran as their, as their subject, which they learn to read, write, and recite using wooden um, boards called um, allo in Hausa. So it's quite different from the quote-unquote modern education system where um, people use blackboards and desks and, um, and books, notebooks and pens, etc. So here it's a wooden board um, and and ink um, that that students use, and what they mostly learn is to read and um, recite the Quran. In comparison to the other schools that have a, a broader curriculum, if you want, you also asked me about um, perceptions of these schools, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there are plenty of misconceptions, or plenty of um, concerns about these schools from um, from different. Um, different positions so that kind of international development community is concerned about them um, being quote unquote out of school because they don't attend the formal education system don't learn secular subjects um, so often they're considered to be out of school or counted as out of school even though they obviously attend some form of education then um, there are concerns from child rights advocates about these children being um abandoned or being exploited because they fend for their own upkeep. Um, so there's a lot of um, negative perceptions of their parents not taking responsibility for them and just sending them off to, to live um, with a teacher without um, providing for them. Now, often the parents don't have the means to provide for them. Um, and, and there are also ideas around our children needing to learn to fend for themselves that, that can explain that. But that's another of the negative um, perceptions of the system. And then there are lots of security concerns as well, often based on very flimsy or, or, or even no evidence where Quranic school students are associated with, um, with um, political violence, um, where um, people think they are easily uh, recruited into political violence or, um, or radical groups such as um, what is popularly called Boko Haram, the, the insurgents in, in northeastern Nigeria. So um, often there's rather limited evidence to back up these claims, but um, because, because people have gotten so used to thinking negatively about these Quranic schools, um, these kind of accusations and suspicions um, are very dynamic and, and people are very likely to believe them even if there's not much evidence. Um, and this isn't part of the book, but most recently we've seen this dynamic um, in the in the context of the COVID pandemic, where Quranic school students were very swiftly um, cast as being vectors of disease, even when there was no epidemiological evidence to back that up, just because perceptions are so negative that um, that any accusations easily chime with people's preconceived ideas. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the founder and editor of the New Books Network. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably love to read. I know I do. So I'd like to recommend you subscribe to Scribd. Scribd is the ultimate reading subscription service, letting you explore all of your interests in any format you choose, ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more for only $9.99 a month. All your favorite things are there. 
you get an entire library for less than the cost of a single book. No complicated credit cards or additional purchases required. If you're not sure what to read, Scribd combines the latest technology with the best human minds to recommend content that you'll love. Want to change things up? You're free to switch between titles, genres, and formats at any time on your phone, tablet, or computer. And here's the best news. Right now, Scribd is offering NBN listeners a free 60-day trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash NBN for your free trial. That's try.scribd.com slash NBN to get 60 days of Scribd for free. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. Let's talk about innovation in America. Did you know that patents are a major driver of job creation and economic growth? Problem is, not every American has the same opportunities when it comes to inventing and patenting. That's especially true for women and people of color. Even though women make up more than half the population, less than 13% of all inventors with a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone can invent and patent. Because research shows that if more women and people of color patented their ideas, it could boost U.S. GDP by almost $1 trillion a year. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. So, um... You, you zoom in to the kind of rural communities to think about uh, how families manage these, these educational um, options and, and the choices they make. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how rural families make sense of this kind of range of uh, educational options and then uh, what, what some of the logic behind uh, boys become, uh, becoming Quranic students as opposed to, to, to other options? Yeah, so I think it's, first of all, we need to have a look at the alternatives that are available and that the modern secular education available in rural areas is um, of of pretty poor quality. Often the teachers are very poorly trained and there's also quite a bit of corruption within the system where um, where it's very difficult for um, children from poor rural families to actually advance through that system because... Um, getting getting good exam results or getting a place in a secondary school is is a bit of a question of luck but also a question of purchasing power and having the right connections so it's 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 difficult for rural families to um make their children progress through this system so that's quite a, a difficult option there's also lots of costs associated with this and um, presumably free um free education system where students have to pay for uniforms and books and, and pens and then there are all kinds of levies um, for to buy chalk or to buy a broom to clean the classroom. So it's, it's kind of a constant drain of money um, that many families just don't have the means to afford for an education that has very uncertain um, future benefits. So that's a government um, education system. Then there are there's the modern Islamic um, education system that is called Islamia, um, Islamia schools is, is the name um, used in in northern Nigeria. Now, these schools are also mostly fees-based. Um, so, um, and again, students need uniforms, um, et cetera. Um, and that makes it, again, more difficult for families to enroll their children there on a long, long-term basis. And, and so the Quranic education system um, has the advantage of being um, much more, much cheaper. Um, and here, the idea, or the, the ideology behind it is that Students um, build up a long-term um, relationship with their teacher. Um, they, uh, when they are when they don't have the means to um, to give anything to the to their teacher, um, then that is not a problem. They're not expulsed. They can continue their studies. And the expectation is that eventually, when they have graduated, that they will maintain that relationship with their teacher and and support the teacher. Then, so um, it's a very different um, conception of. Yes, of the relationship between teacher and student, and of education, um, where um, where maybe the the more modern formal education system is more commodified, whereas this um, Quranic education system is much more based around long term relationships and long term loyalties. Um, so that's that's kind of the context in which 
poor rural families opt for this education system. I should also say that um, the rural economy in northern Nigeria has been um, declining um, for many years, has been neglected um, by the government. So there's a lot of poverty. There's um, a lot of seasonal food, food scarcity. And the Quranic education system, system um, provides relief in these circumstances where families can um, alleviate their subsistence burden during times of scarcity um, and then still draw on, on the labor of, of children in the Quranic education system for, for the farming season when, when, when they need their help. So uh, as you move on, you, you follow the students kind of from the, the rural communities uh, into urban centers, and uh, in addition to uh, what they're doing in the schools, you you look at uh, how they support themselves, uh, which you've, you've kind of hinted to in terms of things like um, begging and, and things like this. Uh, but another part of it is uh, a, a domestic service for uh, the more affluent. So can, can you talk a little bit about this relationship, um, especially in the context of, of what you've told us about how these students are, are generally perceived um, you know, how should we understand their their domestic service to more affluent Nigerians? Yes, let let me put that question in in the context of how the Almaty or how the Quranic students are talked about. So often, the kind of the problems that people perceive outside of, of the system often see that the problem is with the parents that neglect their children and with the teachers um, that are um, aren't providing for for the students. But from the point of view of the students, the, the sources of abuse are actually elsewhere. And um, there, so many of them work as domestic helpers, and many of the students perceive that relationship to be actually a source of ab- abuse and exploitation rather than the parents or the teachers. So um, often um, these relationships are, and the, the terms of these employment relationships aren't very well defined. Um, so there is no formal employment contract. Um, and what the Quranic students aspire to is some kind of long-term relationship, a patron-client relationship where their employers will take responsibility for their well-being in the long term and in a, in a comprehensive way. But often employers aren't very keen to have these responsibilities. And um, so the, the sense that the students have is that, that their employers uh, just care about them as, um, as a source of labor rather than as a person with a set of needs. Um, and so there's, that's a very tense relationship where um, the Quranic students in my research um, held very critical views of um, the, the wealthy um, in society and felt they aren't living up to their responsibilities and aren't taking care of poorer people in society as they should. Now, um, my research was mostly with the Quranic students, so um, their opinions um, are given pride of place in my in my work. Now, from the employer side, um, there is also the question of their fin- finances, obviously, and um, economically, northern Nigeria has, has been suffering a lot um, with rising insecurity, um, falling oil prices, etc. So it's it's difficult also for um, for people who who the Al Majidai might consider to be rich. Now, um, this the economic status of these students um, generally in in poverty. Um, you look at how they use religious discourses to kind of make sense of this. Um, the social standing. So can you, can you tell us about uh, how does Islam play into um, these students understanding uh, the, their role in Nigerian society? Yes. So um, I was very surprised to find that even poor people look down on poverty. So being poor can be quite stigmatizing or it can, it can carry quite a lot of um, negative connotations. Um, and so most of the Quranic students um, come um, from poor rural families. Um, I, um, in my research, that is something that they often tried not to conce- not, not not to reveal straight away. Um, that was quite um, a concealed um, aspect um, that I often only found out after um, being in contact with other members of their family or after knowing them for a long time. That actually um, their enrollment was caused by quite constrained um, conditions in their family. Um, now, in this context where poverty has negative connotations um, and where they were trying um, to hide the material poverty of their families, um, they could um, adopt religious discourses about um, um, themselves being devoted searchers for sacred knowledge and take um, and, and cast deprivation as a necessary 
um, a necessary um, condition for seeking knowledge and for for becoming religiously learned. So in a way, these religious discourses about um, frugality and asceticism help them maintain faith um, in a context where being poor is um, is looked down upon. Um, and so this justification of the Quranic education system as being about learning to endure, to show patience, um, to be able to stand on one's own feet, these discourses actually help them maintain faith um, when confronted with, with negative discourses about poverty because it, they were able to reinterpret this poverty as something po- positive and educative. Um, and in the book, I, I describe, I, I compare that to um, kind of Boy Scout displays um, of uh, Bo- Boy Scout style displays of toughness, of being able to eat any food, whatever whatever food you 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 are offered, you'll be able to eat it. Your stomach will be able to cope with it uh, because you've um, you've been through so much. So there was a certain pride in being able to to cope with difficult circumstances for the sake mm-hmm. of acquiring religious knowledge. Yeah, and related to this, you you look at um, what we might think of as kind of the social politics of respectability. Um, so, what what strategies did these um, these boys employ to pursue a, a respectable uh, social position? And, and then, how were these types of approaches received by the larger community? Yes, so um, in a way, they try to portray. Um, the al Majere as being particularly moral and pious um, individuals and distinguish themselves from other members in society by saying, well, we are particularly, um, we know what is what is um, good moral behavior um, and we don't do these things that maybe the, the children that go to, to the government school do. We don't um, play footballs on the day that we're supposed to study. And um, so in a way, they um, describe themselves as, as having this code of conduct um, that helped them um, feel better about themselves and, and to distinguish themselves from others in society um, by emphasizing their morality and, and often saying, you know, as an al um, one should do this or that and um, taking pride in this identity as a Quranic student by emphasizing the moral credentials um, that, that come with it. Um, they also, yes, emphasize that as, as um, Quranic students, they were more diligent with the, uh, with the Quran and were um, more pious, and that people who, who failed to support Quranic students lacked um, lacked faith and lacked piety. So used they used yes religion and and uh, morality to um, to emphasize their own credentials and and to feel uh, a bit better about themselves in the face of denigration. So especially when when these students beg, they experience quite a lot of abuse, um, and then also in in the houses where they work. Um, they experience abuse. So being able to have recourse to morality and, and to uh, piety help them um, deal with these really difficult experiences. Um, in, in this context, um, and in elsewhere in the book, um, but it, it, it reminded me in this chapter uh, that while you're primarily focusing on these children and, and boys, um, women in society, uh, they're interacting with them in various contexts. So can you talk about the, this kind of relationship between the, these often young boys um, and Nigerian women that they're in, in contact with? What's the kind of relationship? How do the boys kind of navigate uh, their identity in relation to, to women in society? Um, it's kind of all through the book, so I don't have a real pointed <laughs> question, but I, I'd love to hear kind of how this kind of uh, gender uh, gendered aspect of um, the boys' identity as a man or masculinity is is being shaped yeah that's a a tricky one um and for anybody who who finds the time to watch the film they'll see that most of the women in that film actually play very negative roles there aren't um there aren't really any particularly positive female characters in in the film and that might be an accident but it might also represent an experience that um that um often the relationship that um these Quranic students have with women in in their in their lives are quite strained, especially in their work roles as domestic helpers. These um, the, their domestic help is very much managed by women, and being under the authority of a woman um, can be can be can be experienced as um, as being humili- humiliating. Um, and then there's also the additional aspect of um, many households 
being financially tight. And so women are responsible for managing the household budget. Um, and so they might have to argue out why they can't give higher wages to their employees. Um, and they can create a lot of tension, whereas the, ha- the male household head is kind of um, <laughs> um, beyond all of all of these this nitty gritty of the, the household budget management in day to day relationships. Um, so I think that's also a source of why these relationships can be quite tense um, because women are, are managing this domestic employment contract and um, or this domestic employment relationship, which many Quranic students experience as as um, exploitative and not particularly supportive. Um, so the, the later half of the book um, or the later section of the book um, you focus on kind of moving, moving out, and um, how these students kind of fare in in the broader Nigerian context. Um, and you talk about uh, the the, the so called prayer economy, or the political economic significance of this uh, religious knowledge uh, more broadly. So, can you can you tell us about the kind of landscape of spiritual services? Uh, what types of um, uh, religious uh, application uh, the the Al Madri uh, acquire. Um, what types of opportunities does it open up for them, or or perhaps challenges? Yeah. So the the spiritual or the prayer economy um, is about the religious they learn providing services um, to uh, to people in exchange for support. Um, so that might be. Um, potions, uh, it's called Rubutun Shah in Hausa, so it's um, basically writing to be drunk. Um, so that's Quranic verses that are written on a wooden board and then washed off and then drunk. And, um, um, so that's that's one form, um, one, one thing that Quranic students might um, provide. Um, or then there's adua or supplications where um, Quranic students might s- recite the Quran for the benefit of, of someone else. And people seek these kind of services um, mostly for social um, social problems, um, so that might be um, things like depression or a difficult marriage or a difficulty finding a husband, um, or, or people might also seek these kind of spiritual services to um, have success in with their business or to have success in politics. So all kinds of social uses, um, and Quranic students um, or Quranic um, teachers provide these these services. Um, Often they hope to have a long-term relationship with uh, again with a patron um, with a patron um, that will support them in the longer term. But often these exchanges have now turned into one-off cash for cash for service relationships. So don't provide much job security if you want. There's also the issue that the the, the prayer economy is increasingly crowded. So there are the graduates of Quranic schools, but now there's also this modern um, modern Islamic education system which um, graduates from the Quranic education system have to compete with. And that makes it increasingly difficult for graduates of the Quranic education system to make a living with, um, within the spiritual economy, within the, yes, within the prayer economy. Now, uh, you, you also look at uh, beyond this prayer economy, are there, uh, are there opportunities that this, this type of education provides for students or uh, what what alternatives might this uh, this group of, of of young men have? Yeah, what it definitely provides is experience in the petty economy, in the petty urban economy, and context within the economy. Because students learn to fend for themselves for such a long time, and they develop skills um, in the petty economy and context. Um, and many of them, after graduating, move back um, to the rural areas where they came from, but then continue to engage in seasonal migration where they come to the urban centers during um, the uh, the dry season and then continue with petty trade um, or activities in the petty economy. And um, they have mostly acquired the skills for doing that from their time um, as, as a Quranic student and, and contacts that they can rely on. Um, now, there's a lot of concern in in Nigerian discourses, in, in the media around the future of Quranic students. But I argue that um, I don't find it clear whether their prospects are really worse than the prospects of other um, 
um, undereducated urban uh, rural rural youth who might not have access to capital or, or professional skills training. Um, so maybe we also need to question these categories whether whether we should really discuss them as being very separate from other young people whose educational trajectories might also have been interrupted. Um, and that's something I, I would also like to emphasize that many students of the Quranic education system aren't purely products of the Quranic education system. Many of them have been um, to um, other forms of education for a couple of years and then maybe financially they weren't able to continue um, or some of them um, go to adult literacy classes. So they also seek to um, diversify their, their knowledge and their education um, or to go to modern Islamic education. So the, these categories are also a little bit blurred and um, the difficulties that poor young people in northern Nigeria um, face are, are, are very much shared um, across a wider demographic. Now, um, the, the, the book you must have wrapped up uh, you know, a little bit of time ago, but I know that the field work, uh, the primary field work you did was um, some time ago now. Can, can you talk about anything that, that might be changing in Nigeria society? Um, do, do you suspect the social realities have shifted uh, significantly since your field work? Or ha have you been in touch with any of these students or, or others that, um, that might uh, make us rethink the, the kind of role of the El Madri? Um, yeah, I've, I've been in touch. I think, if anything, conditions probably have become worse. I think that is related to, to the insecurity. Um, so there has been insecurity related to, to the Boko Haram conflict, but there has also been in, um, insecurity related to, to uh, criminal activities in, in larger parts of, um, of northwestern Nigeria. Um, so the, the Boko Haram conflict is very much in northeastern Nigeria, but there's also increasing insecurity in all of the north and in, in northwestern Nigeria. Um, so this insecurity um, has nurtured suspicions against um, the Quranic education system that have been there for decades. There were always um, these, these misgivings or suspicions that the Quranic education system would produce um, miscreants or... Um, our problems, um, but that has been reinforced by this insecurity. And um, Quranic students are, are um, easy scapegoats in many situations, um, something that I also explore in the book, how um, having low social standing makes them easy scapegoats and then um, accusations develop a life of their own, if you want, because their standing is low. Um, it's kind of convenient to accuse them of negative things that happen. And because their standing is low, they can't really defend themselves, so um, can't really speak back. So these accusations are taken um, um, to be true. Um, yes, yeah, so insecurity definitely matters. Um, then there's also the impacts of the COVID pandemic, which was a really, um, really big problem economically uh, for many people and has um, likely increased poverty. Um, so in a way that might um, further constrain families in terms of the means they have to um, to send their children to other forms of education. And these other forms of education have also been closed um, for a long time uh, because of COVID and insecurity. Um, so the, the book covers a lot of ground. Um, there's obviously greater detail and uh, the, the kind of ethnographic uh, narrative that you, you paint is really, I mean, we can't, uh, replicated here, of course, but I'm wondering if there's anything that we we weren't able to uh, get to or didn't bring up that you you want to offer as any kind of final thoughts about the project. Um, I think I think um, the kind of the main message maybe for yes for 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 scholars is that it can be really rewarding to experiment um, methodologically and to, to come up with ways that allow us to hear the opinions of 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 young people and to hear um, the opinions of, of people that aren't often listened to and aren't often represented in, in academia. Um, so um, I think that's, yes, that's maybe maybe something I'd like to highlight. Um, that for me, using more participatory approaches and, and using the form of a docudrama um, really allowed me to, to get access to views that I feel are otherwise um, missing in this debate. And um, their research can really help by, by creating a platform for 
um, young people that are often vilified and not necessarily listened to. Yeah, I hope people will check out the uh, the docudrama because that really, um, I, I hadn't really heard of these types of approaches before, uh, but it does seem like, um, you know, after viewing that and re reading the book in relation to it and, and hearing the kind of background together that um, it was really seems like a very productive way to, to access uh, kind of new perspectives that, that would have been uh, limited to most researchers. So, Yeah, yeah. The only caution or caveat maybe here is that um, it was quite a time consuming project and um, Quranic students are very busy. <laughs> so they have their <laughs> studies, they have, um, they, ha they need to earn their living. Um, so in a way, I wish I had been more aware of how, how much time it would ask of them. And um, yes, so it's maybe something to bear in mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there were also the, the suspicions um, about a project run by, by a white, by a Westerner, a foreigner, um, and what, what, what the underlying motives were where the students who participated in the film project were suspected of um, of hiding money that I was presumably making with this film, um, or of being being dupes, um, that they work for me and um, that I make a lot of money with this film and don't give it to them. So there were, yeah, all kinds of suspicions as well um, that I think it's important to anticipate um, or that are difficult to anticipate, but that um, can mess with these kind of um, projects. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the things you've been working on since this project? Yeah, so I've um, followed um, the COVID pandemic a bit in in Kano, um, and so I'm interested in exploring a bit the, the securitization of Quranic education in the context of that pandemic, where Quranic students were very swiftly declared vectors of disease, even even though the data isn't there. So that's that's something I'm interested in exploring and, and schools were forcibly closed and Quranic students were deported to, to their home states in quite a quite a brutal manner with um, schools being cleared at gunpoint in the middle of the night. Um, so I'm interested ex in exploring um, the, the links between um, kind of this public health crisis and then pre-existing perceptions of these schools as a presumed security threat and how that has then given rise to um, quite hostile policies. Um, I am involved in a collaborative project on the impact of um, the Boko Haram conflict on Islamic education, together with um, um, Dr. Um, Yagana Buka from the University of Meiduguri, where we are exploring how um, how this conflict has actually affected the working of Islamic schools in the region um, and perceptions of these schools. Um, so that's something I've I'm involved in. Um, and then, actually, because there was a lot of insecurity in northern Nigeria, um, I, I found it difficult to um, to do long-term field work there. And so I have moved um, um, to Senegal, where I did research on Islamic education in a transnational setting. So looking at um, the diaspora and practices of sending children back to Senegal for their Islamic education. And I did field work in in New York, in the U.S., with um, Senegalese communities there and on their education, or educational decision making, and decisions to send children to Senegal for part of their education. Well, I, I look forward to reading that in the future as well. And uh, good luck on everything. Thanks for making time to talk about your book. Well, thank you so much for having me. That was my conversation with Hannah Hoknar about Quranic schools in northern Nigeria: everyday experiences of youth, faith, and poverty published with Cambridge University Press in 2018.